Okay, so welcome everybody to this talk on uh, Stein complements and projective manifolds. So uh, today I will speak about work in progress with Thomas Petenau. And so this is a project we've been working on this whole uh, year and it's it's 90% finished, but maybe the last 10% will take as much work as the first 90%. So we'll see. Hopefully it will be, will be done soon. Okay, so this is work in progress with uh, Thomas Peternell. And so the, um, uh, the, the title of this uh, series of talks is Analytic Techniques in Birational Geometry. So uh, the way I will handle this in, in this in this talk is that our starting point is going to be some analytic hypothesis. So that a certain complex manifold is a Stein manifold. And then I will try to figure out what this tells us about the geometry. Okay, so somehow as usual in my talks, all the analysis has been done by other people and uh, I would try to give translations in terms of geometry, okay. And uh, everything I will say, I mean, sort of obviously will take place over the complex numbers. Okay, so uh, what's the starting point? So let's start with an example, which we all know very well. So if you start with X, some projective manifold, and uh, you take a divisor in this manifold, so y in x is going to be, let's say, a smooth ample divisor. I mean, smoothness is not very important, um, but certainly it simplifies the way you state things. So you take a smooth ample divisor, then uh, the ample divisor might not be very ample, but certainly some multiple is. So O, X, M, Y is very ample. And so we get an embedding. So our variety X is embedded in some projective space such that uh, OX and Y is the pullback of uh, O of one of this projective space. And so this tells us that set theoretically uh, this divisor y is cut out by a hyperplane. I mean, scheme theoretically, it's m times the divisor which is cut out, but set theoretically, um, you're a hyperplane section. So set theoretically, y is x intersected with some hyperplane. And so now if you take the complement x minus y, well, that's contained in the projective space minus this hyper hyperplane, which is simply uh, CN, okay? So you see that if you have an ample divisor, its complement is an F manifold. Okay. And so uh, the question we're asking is, uh, can you go the other way around? Okay, so question. Assume that you have y in x, some smooth uh, irreducible divisor. Such that uh, the complement x minus y is affine. Okay, let's say for the moment, then what does this tell us about Y? What can we say about Y? Or uh, actually, it's not really about Y, it's about the embedding of Y in X. And the way we try to encode this information is that we try to say something about the normal bundle. So more precisely, what can you say about the normal bundle? OK, 
Okay. Okay, so that's the question. And um, now, of course, as you know, algebraic and projective geometers, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what, how can we use this hypothesis that uh, X minus Y is affine? Okay, I mean, that's, uh, that's somehow how you make this thing more handleable. So how to use the assumption X minus Y is affine. Well, what do I know about affine manifolds? Well, the first thing I know that in an affine manifold, I do not have any compact subvarieties. Okay, so first, first observation is X minus Y affine. This means that there are no compact subvarieties, you know, of positive dimension. Okay. That's the first thing I know about FR manifolds. And the second thing is that on an FR manifold, I have a lot of holomorphic functions, for example, the polynomials. Okay. So, sorry. First observation and second observation. If you're affine, then this means that um, many holomorphic functions, holomorphic functions, for example, polynomials. Okay, you have many polynomials on CN. We restrict them to your FR manifolds. This gives you many functions. Okay. Okay, uh, so these are the two things I know about FR manifolds. And actually this brings me to the, to the definition in my title, um, Stein manifolds. So what do I know about them? Well, once again, I do not know a lot about them. There's one way you can define them, which is pretty formal. Um, let's, let me just write it down. So a complex manifold U is Stein if it doesn't have any cohomology. So if for every coherent analytic sheaf, uh, S on U, we have no higher cohomology. Okay, we have H K. Q, U, S, zero, or all Q, at least one. Okay, I mean, certainly from the point of view of complex analysis, that's a very bad definition because I mean, it's actually more like the statement of uh, theorem B of Cartan, but you could define it this way. That's certainly a definition that, that works. And um, this definition gives a lot of uh, information. So for example, if you want to think more concretely about what a Stein manifold is, um, a consequence of this is that um, if you have U Stein of dimension N, then uh, you can always find an embedding of U in some uh, complex space. So U in C to the power two N plus one. Okay, so you get an embedding in, in the affine complex space, but uh, of course this embedding is given by holomorphic functions. So typically it's not a series of poly polynomials. Okay, but okay, it's relatively concrete uh, type of manifold and uh, so this is one consequence of this of this definition. Um, but what we will use are two other consequences, um, and you you will see this other. This is very close to to our two observations. So uh, what we will use is the following. Uh, 
if uh, u is Stein, okay, then uh, first thing, it does not have complex separate compact subvarieties. And I mean, this is clear because uh, you have this embedding in C to the power two n plus one. So you don't have complex subvarieties. And second one, you have a lot of uh, holomorphic functions and you can make this more explicit if you take Zn, some uh, discrete sequence in U Okay, so no accumulation point, then um, you will be able to find a holomorphic function that exists f from u to c, a holomorphic function, which has the property that if you look at the values on this, uh, on this discrete set, well, if you take the absolute value then uh, this goes to infinity or n to infinity. Okay, so in particular, you find a holomorphic function which is unbounded. Okay, so this that's a way of saying that we have many holomorphic functions. Okay, whenever you choose a type of this discrete sequence, then you will get a, a function which grows to infinity on this sequence. Okay. So these are somehow the two consequences of the Stein property that I will use. And you see, this is just a bit more formal way of writing down the two observations about basic properties of FR manifolds um, that I recalled just before. Okay, so how do these uh, properties now relate to our problem? Okay, so how uh, these properties relate to our problem. Hmm. And let me do this. Um, let me give the answer in a special case. So let's look at the first interesting case. So you have y in x smooth irreducible. And let me assume that X is a surface. So, uh, so Y is a curve. And um, to be, so that's clear, you know, X is projective, okay? So X is projective, Y is projective, but then the complement of course is not projective. So that, and that's where I put the assumption that it's Stein. Okay, so this is projective. And now, so assume that uh, u, that's x minus y, is Stein. Then what can we what can we say about uh, y? Well, certainly, first thing is that if c in x is another irreducible curve, that is different from the curve y, well, then the intersection number is strictly positive. Ah, not strictly positive, because if these two curves are disjoint, well, then this gives you a compact curve in the complement, and this cannot exist, okay? So here you see that somehow your divisor y is very positive on many, many curves, but of course, there's one curve, uh, which does not fit item one, that's the curve C. Uh, no, that's the curve Y, sorry. So um, what can we say about this? But well, there we also get something. We can show that Y squared, it might be zero, but it's certainly non-negative. Okay, so how do you, how do you prove this? Now, let's do a proof. Well, if y squared is strictly negative, then you can apply Grad's criterion and contract the curve onto a point. Okay, then by Grad,
exists some map x to x prime such that the curve y is contracted onto a point. And here uh, x prime, that's some compact analytic surface might not be uh, might not be projective might not be very nice but you know uh, at least it's normal okay uh, normal probably not smooth okay and so you contract the curve onto a point and now you try to use your second property how do you do this okay so Let's make a picture. Here is x. Here is x prime. And in here, I have my curve y, which I will contract onto this point here. And now what I choose is, I choose a discrete sequence, which is, you know, it's discrete in x minus y but it converges uh, to a point in C, okay? So this is my sequence set N. Okay, so I take sequence set N, N in N that converges to some point in Y. Okay, and I certainly can do this in a way so that I get uh, a sequence which is discrete in X minus Y, okay? So um, now I, I use my Stein property, okay? I have chosen this discrete sequence in X minus Y and so get, I get a holomorphic function, okay? So you get F from X minus Y to C, which is holomorphic and it's, well, its absolute values go to infinity uh, on the discrete self sequence, so it's not bounded. Okay, so you get this uh, holomorphic function, but of course, x minus y, that's isomorphic to x prime minus this point, okay, because that's why, how you blow down. And so you can apply Hartog's theorem. Hartog's theorem tells you that if you have this co-dimension two set on your normal uh, space, then the holomorphic uh, function extends, okay? So F extends to some function F bar from X prime to C. And uh, so it's constant and certainly bounded. Okay. And so there we get our contradiction. Okay. Okay. So uh, this finishes this first proof. And uh, so what is the what is the upshot of these two observation? If you have a, a curve in a surface such that the complement is Stein, then uh, what you get is that this divisor y in x, it's nef, okay? It's non-negative on all the curves in x and even strictly positive on most of them, and even strictly positive on all curves, which are different from y, okay? Okay, so that's a good start. So you see uh, our starting point was uh, if I have an ample divisor, then the complement is affine. Now I take the Stein property and I get that I'm nef and at least strictly positive on all but one curve. So um, now I'm thinking, okay, I, I want to go more towards ampleness. Um, so next step would be to prove that it's big. So you see that I get uh, many sections. So next step would be, does this imply that Y is big? Okay, can we get something a bit more? So can we get that uh, 
the space of global sections grows at the maximal rate. So here on a surface that's uh, of order m squared. And there the answer is no. Okay. So there the answer is no. And that's a, that's a classical example, um, which is due to Serre. Okay. So let me show you this example. Um, so you start with E, an elliptic curve. And then you take an unsplit extension of O of E by itself. Okay, H1 of O is uh, one. So you get an, you know, this unsplit extension of vector bundle it exists. And uh, now what you do is X, that's going to be the projectivization of this vector bundle V. And in here, you have the projectivization of uh, O of E of this quotient o, o of E. And so that's going to be uh, your divisor Y, okay? And now uh, you can check just from this definition that uh, this divisor Y, it's NAF, it's NAF and strictly positive on all curves, strictly positive. on all curves, uh, which are different from y, but uh, y squared is exactly zero, okay? So here you somehow get uh, this, this boundary situation and it turns out, and so this is why uh, it's called says example, Ser, he proved that this complement x minus y, um, this is Stein, this is Stein, but it's not a fine. Okay. okay, so this is an important example because it shows you that already for surfaces, you know, uh, Stein and affine, this gives you something different. Okay, so you see that somehow here uh, you do not get, uh, you cannot hope much more. On the other hand, uh, let me also say that uh, Grip and Wong, um, they, they looked at this subject and they used the result of Goodman, which is uh, an old result. So this was published in uh, Annals in 69 um, to show that uh, if X minus Y is not only Stein, but affine, um, then Y is big. Okay. Okay. So, so this this somehow tells you why uh, we are looking rather at the the assumption that X minus Y is Stein, um, and do not want to make the assumption that X minus Y is affine, because somehow we know from the examples and the ex existing results that affineness that's going to be very restrictive. Okay. Um, and uh, while somehow on a technical level, the, the consequences of a fineness and steinness that we can actually use, uh, they're very similar, okay? So we try to, to work in the general setup uh, knowing that we will discover more examples and maybe more, more uh, pathologies, okay? Now, um, let me uh, say a bit something about uh, what, we, what we do. So the first thing is, um, so Goodman, he proved this result, which Grip and Wong then used to prove this, uh, this nice statement. He actually asked something um, stronger. So it's, there's this question, let's say conjecture of Goodman, who asked that if X minus Y is affine, um, then uh, Y is NAF. Okay, so, and more explicitly, I mean, this means that the normal bundle of Y in X is NAF. Okay, of course, I mean, 
back in 69, uh, people didn't know what NEF were. So he, he made a conjecture which, uh, which is a stronger property than NEFness. And certainly what we have seen is that if you have a, a curve in a surface, then this conjecture is true, okay? And so the first thing that we do is uh, we go one step further, we, we look at the three-dimensional case and it turns out that, uh, well, this conjecture of Goodman, that's not true. Okay, so theorem, uh, which is very much written down. So if the dimension of X is three, so you have a surface in a free fold, then uh, such that, sorry, and X minus Y is affine, actually Stein suffices, then uh, the normal bundle is always pseudo-effective. But we, we, constru we construct an example where the normal bundle is not NAF, okay? But there exists example where uh, NYX is not NAF. Okay, so that's our first statement, um, which tells you somehow that somehow the, the model which you, which you see when you look at the surface case it kind of translates to higher dimension, but not in the strongest possible sense. Okay, and uh, I don't really want to go into the proof. Um, let me just say that, so proof, this is based on results of uh, Matsumura and Totaro, it's based on results of Matsumura and Totaro. So they were looking at, you know, these partial positivity properties, Q positivity, Q ampleness, uh, you know, things you define in terms of some intersections. And um, so uh, they, they, they studied this and they obtained a number of results. I mean, it's very difficult difficult uh, to, to work with these properties because so it's just a very partial form of positivity um, but they obtained the results that if you translate them in our context and use some you know uh, intersection properties then you can can obtain this okay and if one wants to go to high dimension there would be some you know difficult analytic problems to solve okay so that's somehow the, the general situation uh, when you have a divisor in a projective manifold, the complement is Stein, uh, then you can expect some positivity, but maybe not too much, okay? And now in the in this uh, second part of my talk, I would like to focus on a special case uh, where we show how this kind of considerations uh, can be used to understand the, the tangent bundle of a manifold, okay? So this is somehow part two to um, canonical extensions. Okay, so uh, let me give you the setup for this. So I take now M uh, a projective manifold And I take uh, alpha some ample divisor, or you know, if you're if you're more an analytic person, then uh, you know some Kähler class. Alpha is an ample divisor, or um, more generally, you can take a Kähler class. Now this ample divisor, so this uh, that's a cohomology class in H one of M omega M. And H1 of M omega M, I can see this as X1 of TM OM, okay? So uh, 
this, uh, this ample divisor, the scalar class gives me an exact sequence. So we get an exact sequence, which produces me a vector bundle that's an extension of the tangent bundle of M and O. Okay. And now uh, what I will do is I will set X to be the projectivization of this vector bundle V alpha. And in there, I have the projectivization of my tangent bundle. And so that's going to be my divisor Y. Okay. And then the notation is that I will set set alpha M, that's the complement, okay, X minus Y, and this will be the canonical extension of M. So this, um, let me say, you know, canonical extensions, they were studied in very much detail in this uh, recent paper by Grape and Wong, and some, somehow this is the starting point of, uh, of our project. Um, but this kind of uh, extension of vector bundles associated to some ample divisor, this also appears in other papers where you study uh, churn classes of uh, vector bundles. So this appears in Mia Yoka's work and there's work by Grip Kubikos and Peter Nell, uh, where they study, you know, Fano, Fano varieties satisfying certain conditions and so on. So um, you might have seen this kind of construction uh, recently. Okay, and so so this is somehow my my setup, and now Grip and Wong, um, they prove that all the time, this canonical extension uh, Z alpha will not contain any curve. Okay, so Z alpha M does not contain any curves. Okay, you, so if you think about the two properties which I used of Stein manifolds not containing any curves and having many holomorphic functions, well, certainly item one is always okay. Now, uh, what I want to ask is, so now I will assume that this canonical extension is Stein. Uh, what does this tell me about the tangent bundle? Okay, so question, assume that alpha um, M is Stein, uh, what can we say about uh, the tangent bundle of M, or at least, you know, or at least I would like to say something about uh, the anti-canonical divisor. Okay. Now, um, so in order that, so that things are clear, let me just remind you why somehow this construction is the right setup for saying something about the tangent bundle. So, uh, so why do I think that the canonical extension being Stein should tell me something about the tangent bundle? So uh, the divisor class of this projectivization P T M, this, divisor class, that's the tautological class on uh, my projectivized vector bundle. You have P of V, okay, so you have your projectivized vector bundle over M, and here you have the tautological line bundle, and this divisor Y that we're looking at, that's an effective divisor uh, in this uh, tautological linear system, okay? So that's, uh, that you get, you get this just by looking at the definition via the extension. And so since you have this, this tells you that the normal bundle of Y in X, well, that's the restriction of the tautological O of one to the projectivization of the tangent bundle. So it's going to be the tautological of your tangent bundle, okay? So studying the normal bundle of Y in X, that's the same as studying the vector bundle 
t of m. Okay, so this is somehow how these two are related. And now uh, let's see what happens for curves. Okay, so that things become a bit clearer, hopefully. Okay, let's see what happens for curves. So first, first curve that I look at is P1. Okay, so I take my definition, I write down my uh, sequence of vector bundles. Okay, so that's an unsplit extension of vector bundles. So the tangent bundle of P1, that's O of two. So you have this extension of O and O of two and then it's not hard to figure out that V alpha has to be two copies of O of one. Actually, you can see, you should, might remember that uh, this is just the Euler sequence for the tangent bundle of P1, okay? So it's the, the sequence which I wrote down, that's just the Euler sequence, okay? So now I know V alpha. So this tells me that my manifold X, that's the projectivization of V alpha. So it's the projectivization of two copies of O. So of O of one, so that's just P1 cross P1. Okay. And in there I have Y, which is the projectivization of the tangent bundle and so this is just a curve P1. And uh, you can compute the, the class of this curve in this quadric. And uh, you can check that the class of Y, the, its divisor class, that's 011. Okay, so it's an ample, even a very ample divisor. Okay, it's a very ample divisor. And so you see that for P1, uh, the canonical extension Z alpha is uh, Stein, it's even affine. Okay, because it's a complement of an ample divisor. Okay, so P1, no problem. Now, uh, next curve, let's go to an elliptic curve. Okay, so in this case, I write down again my extension OM V alpha TM. So it's an unsplit extension. And the tangent bundle of an elliptic curve, that's O. So you have an unsplit extension of O by O. Well, um, there's just one such extension on an elliptic curve, and that's the one from Serre's example. Okay, so that's Serre's example. Serre's example. So uh, by its result, ZM alpha is Stein, but not affine. So that's the case of elliptic curves. Now let's go to higher genius. So I write down again my extension. unsplit extension, which is now more difficult to, to understand. Um, but again, you know, I ha will have this root surface PV alpha, which contains the projectivization of PTM, which is, so this is X and this is Y. So I have a curve in a surface and uh, you can compute the self-intersection of the curve Y squared that's two minus two G of M. So that's strictly negative. But now you're, you're in the situation of our, of our example of our first proof. Um, this tells us that the complement X minus Y, this is not Stein. Okay, because you can contract this curve onto a point and then uh, this excludes the possibility of many having many 
holomorphic functions. So uh, what you get from looking at this case of curves is that if the canonical extension of M is Stein, then it should have a rather special geometry. Okay, so that's somehow the uh, leading theme here. And now let me tell you uh, what we proved. So here comes the theorem. One. So uh, assume that you have uh, M projective manifold of dimension at most three. such that the canonical extension is Stein. Then we get a strong restriction on the birational geometry because we prove that there are no birational contractions. Okay, then M does not admit any birational Mori contractions Hence, either M is a minimal model, so KM is NEF, or M is a Mori fiber space. Okay, so somehow you see that this property of being Stein, uh, at least in low dimension, completely evacuates uh, the, the birational geometry. And uh, let me say a word about the proof. So what's the idea? So uh, wh why the restriction to, to, to low dimension? Well, it's because we want to look at divisorial contraction, okay? So if you have M to M prime uh, birational contraction that uh, contracts a divisor E onto something of lower dimension onto, you know, so the E lives in M and uh, so you contract onto some, let's say B in M prime of co-dimension at least two Then somehow the idea is to, to do something which is very similar to the argument which we made for, uh, for, for the negatives curves in the surfaces. Okay, we want to say that if, I, if I'm able to replace something of co-dimension one by something of co-dimension at least two, then I will get a contradiction to the Stein property. Okay, and how is this supposed to work? So somehow what you want to show is, want to show that I uh, take the canonical extension of M and then I get some map to a canonical extension over M prime. And here I want to show that I have a co-dimension one set, which then becomes a co-dimension uh, at, at least two set. Okay, so you want a to play around with this uh, with this idea, and um, I mean, it sounds like an obvious idea, but of course, somehow there's a, there's a difficulty um, when you do a birational uh, contraction. Uh, even if M is smooth, M prime is not going to be smooth, and uh, the singularities are exactly the locus on which you have contracted. So uh, there, you will get get some, some extra problems, okay? So um, somehow it's clear that this works for a blow up, but then we have to deal with the singularities, okay? Have to take singularities of M prime into account, okay? This somehow will tell you that the canonical extension of M prime is not as easy as for a manifold, 
but we are able to manage uh, the situation for uh, hypersurface singularities and quotient singularities, and that's enough to, to deal with everything up to dimension three. Okay, so it's more large, it's a larger statement about birational, you know, divisorial Mori contractions, and in low dimension, it covers everything. Okay, so that's a uh, first restriction on the birational geometry. And uh, for surfaces, we, uh, we can go much further. Can go, we have gone already much further, um, but, but there's some, some work left. We're much further. So that's our, our last result. And let me say, so this is, this is still in progress because there are some cases which we li would like to exclude, but um, I mean, it's not completely written down. Okay, and I mean, it gets more tricky. So assume that M smooth projective surface such that uh, a canonical extension is Stein, uh, then of the, one of the following holes. So first possibility is that the tangent bundle of M is actually Neff, okay? And what are these guys? I mean, you have P2, P1 cross P1. Uh, you have Ceres example. Uh, of course, you have abelian surfaces. So this is, these are the guys we, we would expect, okay, from our general considerations. Uh, these are the guys that we would expect. And uh, in, tip, in these cases, you can show that uh, the canonical extension actually is Stein. Okay, so these are the guys that you want. Then uh, we have a second possibility um, that M is a K-free surface without any nodal rational curves. Okay, without nodal rational curves. So uh, let me recall you that um, it is known that every projective K free surface contains a rational curve, even infinitely many rational curves. And there are many classes of K free surfaces where people have shown existence of nodal rational curves and even, you know, infinitely many of them. I mean, there's been quite some activity in this direction in the last years, so work by Chen, Gonelas, and Liedke. And so for in Typically, we would not expect that there can be a K-free surface without nodal rational curves, but it's not known in general. So this case hypothetically uh, might, might exist, um, but you know, I don't think that, uh, that this really appears. And then there's a third case, which is a bit more annoying, um, which is root surfaces over curves of genus at least two. Okay root surface over curve B of genus G of B at least two. And where this uh, vector bundle V is snap and stable. Okay kind of uh, interesting root surfaces. And this last case, um, I mean, it's not, it's, not quite, it's not quite finished. I mean, we, we would hope uh, that uh, for these surfaces, uh, the canonical extension cannot be Stein. And somehow, if you think about uh, what we saw for curves, the idea that if you're Stein and then you have this map onto a curve of higher genus, this doesn't look right, okay? I mean, you had this very easy argument uh, for a canonical extension of higher, higher genus curves, which told you that somehow these things, they don't, they don't fit together, okay? 
So somehow you you would expect that this you can deal with this case uh, rather easily, but uh, let me indicate why maybe it, it's not as easy as you think. Um, third case, stiff is diff probably difficult, certainly difficult for us, um, because if you look at the tangent sequence. So let me call this ruling F. So then I have the relative tangent sheaf. And here I have the pullback of the tangent uh, bundle of B. And so you see, this is somehow, this is the guy which is negative. This is negative because the genus of B is at least two. And so this somehow gives you the feeling that uh, this tangent bundle is not very positive and somehow this should contradict the Stein property. But you can use this, uh, this stability of V to show that, I mean, it's very easy computation that Tm of B is relative tangent sheaf. This is actually Neff, okay? So you have a Neff subsheaf of the tangent bundle. So this tells you that Tm is actually pseudo-effective, okay? So it's canonical class um, is, is, uh, is pseudo-effective. And so here you can see why this case three, this is actually not very far from our case one, okay? And this somehow explains why uh, it's, uh, it's more difficult to show uh, that for these kind of surfaces, the canonical extension is not Stein, we have we have some arguments which are more sophisticated and you know very very much for this for this kind of situation and uh, we hope to to finish this in a future not too far away so thanks a lot for watching and uh, see you soon